What you see here is the central element of the Providence Athenaeum's fountain uh, before we started working on it. As you can see, it's uh, dirty, there's rust, there's all kinds of uh, dark areas. Uh, we've now cleaned those, which I'll show you in a few minutes, and in the center you see the bowl. And if you look carefully, you can see a little fragment missing uh, at the center of the bowl. Here's a close-up of the bowl before we started working on it, before we cleaned it, and certainly before we filled this gap, which is the uh, subject of this video. But here you can see the gap. It starts there, goes around like this, all the way up to here, and down there, and back around here. So this, this line basically has to go across here, similar to this one over here. So that's our challenge. So we started the process uh, of restoring the uh, fountain by uh, cleaning, and here is Richard Wolf, our stone uh, worker, stone craftsman, who is in the process of doing the primary cleaning. This is an important part of our project was to deal with the lead grouting. Now, Right here, you can see that's lead right along there. It's a lead cushion because lead is soft, and uh, the original creators of the fountain put put these pieces of lead in there to to soften any movement that would happen as both as they were assembling the fountain, and uh, as o over time, as the fountain moves because everything moves. And here's an example here where. Uh, Probably freezing water has made this this uh, this block over here move outwards in this direction, uh, and has exposed this big gap, which eventually the uh, the lead fell out of. So it was our job to fill that in and seal all these joints and dress all these so that they they appear a little uh, better. Um, to the observer. Here is uh, Richard's work after we've finished filling, and you can see right here there's lead. We used a, a half inch uh, diameter lead coil and uh, rammed it in there uh, so that it was it's large enough to span the gap and be able to ram tightly up against the edges of the stone like that. So uh, there we are. That's the complete the completed uh, fill, and you can see over here this has been dressed to uh, be more consistent as well. So here we are uh, back to our cleaned bowl and center area. You can see that all of the, most of the dark areas have been removed. One of, one of the important things is not to over clean. And you can see there's a, still a little bit of rust and a little bit of darkness because you don't want to make it so that the entire piece is like it's brand new. After all, it does have an age and we want to respect that. So here we are and now we're ready to proceed with our major uh, challenge, which is figuring out how to make the fill. And after we're done with all this that I'm going to show you, we're going to plan uh, going to the Athenaeum and doing the actual work. To make the form itself, we made an experimental um, mold uh, that's made out of a flexible rubber, which you will see in a few minutes. And then I used it because it's flexible to stretch and bind to the surface of our experimental rock. And then filled it and uh, did the same work that very closely approximates what we'll be doing on site. The thing that's important to understand is that there are so many fine details involved in this and there's so much sequencing involved that all this experimentation is necessary, just like performing a play. You have to make it so that when you go on site and do the job, there are as few mistakes, flexible areas as possible. There will always be them, but we try to minimize them. So we might make two or three or four experiments or more until we feel like we get it right. And then we go to uh, the Providence Athenaeum and do the job. So what you're gonna see in the following 
uh, little movies and clips is uh, our process of experimentation. I hope you enjoy the movie. We used a piece of stone that we removed from a hidden section of the fountain in the back and uh, took the chunk and then started to break it up so uh, we could have various size, um, everything from dust to uh, chunks uh, that would uh, hopefully approximate the texture of the surrounding stone uh, at the bowl. So here you can see us uh, breaking, here, see me breaking it up and uh, and uh, preparing it for the epoxy mix. Okay, here's the flexible mold, which is made of this wonderful putty-like material with a catalyst that you push against the form and then it solidifies, or into this rubbery state anyway. And uh, then uh, we take the mix of epoxy and stone and color and p powdered pigments. Uh, we wanted originally to pour it in. You see a little tiny hole in that sprue we made, but that didn't work. We had to stuff it in with a sculpture tool. So now we're leaving it uh, to set. Okay, leaving it to set. And now after it's set, we're pulling the mold apart. You can see how we've um, cut, pre-cut the mold so that it opens in a predictable manner. This is wonderful, weird stuff. Look at that. It's almost alive. Look at that. Okay, so it's coming away, and there, revealing inside, is our fill. So now we have that ready to work on with a, a little bit of uh, shards and shreds and pieces of material to be finished, uh, which we're cutting away. I tried uh, using a using a knife, but the uh, the uh, granite inside made that not work so well, so I changed to a more effective uh, tool, which uh, is a grinder. Uh, and the grinder is uh, something that will cut away uh, the stone along with the epoxy and finish the surface uh, almost uh, very close. And then we'll uh, take it and sand it with some sandpaper to get it into the final shape. On top here is a piece of the original rock, and down here, all the way through here, is the fill that I made. Now, there are three issues. Number one is the form, is how well this integrates with, the, how, how well the fill integrates with the surrounding stone. So you can see this right here is the interface between the two uh, bodies. This is the fill. This is the stone. So you can see that um, that worked well. And the grinding and the forming are, are just fine. Okay, so that's the form. Now, next uh, is the variegation, the, how, the, how the surface appears because stone, especially this stone, has a lot of variation in it, little chunks of black and the little spots of black among the gray areas of various grays. So uh, I did that by, uh, as you saw, crushing up the stone into various size bits, mix, and I mixed them with the epoxy and filled it. And then I took it and ground it uh, with the diamond grinding wheel to expose the insides of those um, chunks and making it like this. So, so there we have that um, I guess you'd call it a texture, although it's really not. Uh, and then, and then there's the issue of color. Now, you know, you look at it and you say, this is gray and it's gray, you know. Well, it's not really. It's white and black and a little bit of red and a little bit of yellow. And, and, and so, you know, how do you come up? Well, you fool back and forth and back and forth, a little of this and a little of that until you come up with the right mix. And, um, so here we are. That's my mix. So, uh, then uh, I wound up with a, uh, a good approximation. Now, one more thing happened. I, I, I did one more thing, which is, uh, you see the area surrounded by the black marker line. You notice how it's darker than the, uh, so, uh, this section here. That's because I, I um, uh, put a layer, a watery layer of acrylic, not watery, low viscosity layer of acrylic uh, that pen onto the surface, which penetrated the stone and penetrated, um, uh, it, it penetrated a little bit into the epoxy, 
but it mainly penetrated the stone, and uh, it also made them very similar. Uh, so that we wound up with not only uh, helping further um, make them alike, but also protecting the body of the stone, which is porous, from the penetration of water. And we sus I suspect that the uh, water may have been the reason that that piece of stone came off in the first place and spalled, they call it. It means that the water got inside and lifted a fragment by water freezing and pushing the piece away. So uh, <clears throat> this acrylic will will uh, avoid that by filling any micro cracks like I saw a few of them. It'll fill those and completely uh, isolate uh, the uh, body of the bowl from any water that is in the bowl. Thanks for looking at this little movie to explain a little bit about our process restoring the Providence Athenaeum's fountain. And feel free to contact us for any questions you have.